Should I begin? Umkar, should I begin? Yes, please begin. Okay, a very good evening and a warm welcome to all of you to the JGLS Illumini webinar on investment funds, a practice area for lawyers, a primer by Ms. Nandini Pathak, an Illumini alumna of Nindal Global Law School and a leader in the investment funds practice group at Nisha Desai Associates. I'm Professor Shireen Moti. Uh, I'm the pro assistant professor of law and director of alumni relations at OP Jindal Global University. OP Jindal Global University is a multidisciplinary institution which was founded in the year 2009. Our chancellor is Mr. Naveen Jindal and our vice chancellor is Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar. Within 10 years of the founding of OP Jindal Global University, we have been recognized as an institute of eminence and the Jindal Global Law School has been ranked as the number one law school by the QS World Rankings. With this, I have great pleasure in introducing Ms. Nandini Pathak as our first speaker for today. She has had an outstanding journey. Uh, she is a remarkable alumna of Jindal Global Law School. She is currently working as a leader in the investment funds practice at Nisha Desai Associates and is actively involved in the firm's thought leadership on the venture capital and equity, private equity side. She is really a woman in a leadership role in corporate India, and uh, we as uh, as our fellow colleagues, uh, as uh, young law aspirants, should be looking up to her because she is really playing a key role in leadership in a world uh, of uh, corporate India. Um, the webinar is going to be uh, on investment funds as a legal practice area in India. It is not a commonly known or understood topic, and therefore, Ms. Pathak believes that uh, there's a lot more to be uh, discussed and disseminated about this practice area, especially amongst young lawyers and legal aspirants. Uh, with this, I invite uh, Ms. Nandini to uh, give her opening remarks. Thank you, Shireen. So um, I think knowledge sharing uh, goes way back between you and I, for sure. I remember that, uh, uh, you know, you were almost always found studying in your room and whenever i would uh, bother you with the questions of why what and how you were ever so happy to discuss with me uh, and i'm so happy that you continue to share knowledge every day with students as a professor today um, i'm also trying to take this opportunity today to share some knowledge which i think uh, would help lawyers understand that investment funds is also a practice area that they can explore uh in their career that's very nice of you nandini and we would like to thank you for taking out this time to uh, conduct this webinar for our students and for the larger legal community so my first question to you is and it is something which would interest anybody who is wanting to pursue law as a career is what were the reasons behind you choosing a uh, law law as a career uh, for yourself what made you choose law as a career Oh, okay. Uh, so I think career, uh, choosing a career can be quite overwhelming. Thankfully, back in my day, I was told to look at it not as a career choice, but as what I want to study next. Uh, that took down the pressure a little. Uh, but even what to study next was a big question mark. So I was asked to figure out the core qualities in my view about myself that I want to hone further. So. At that time, I thought I was a sol solution-oriented person and someone who liked to simplify complicated things. So then I decided studying law is something that could hone these skills more. And I decided to enter a law school. Of course, uh, judges always seemed very cool to me. So that was there somewhere in my mind. OK that that are uh, good reasons for uh, pursuing the career in law so first you decide to study law and only then can you start thinking about making a career in it and honing one skills is uh, something definitely law aspirants should look upon so what you spent five long years at Jindal Global Law School and you were a classmate and we had so many ups and downs. We were engaged in so many activities. There was academics, research, mooting, so many of those things. So my question to you now is that how important was your journey uh, in Jindal Global Law School uh, to becoming a successful lawyer today? And what impact has it had on you as a person uh, to study law at Jindal Global Law School? 
sure. Wow, that again takes me back. So other than a prestigious law degree and some really great memories, I think one very important tool that JGLS equipped me with for my uh, legal profession was to look at the philosophy and policy of law before reading to apply it. Uh, that continues to help me today. I think uh, over these five years, we went through different faculty members and different legal subjects, but there was one common underlying theme among the teaching methods, which was to make us understand the why of the law before we got to the how of the law. And like I said, it continues to help me today while approaching the law, my clients, my colleagues, uh, and that's that's been great. Other than that, I like how holistic the upbringing has been in our college for me. Uh, it was not only uh, an egg. For a second, your screen is a bit distorted, uh, or maybe it's appearing only to me. So uh, let it clear up uh, for a minute, I guess. Uh, sure. Unkar, would you be able to help in this? Um, I guess she's facing some internet issues, so can't be helped from our end. Okay, Nandini, you mind switching off your video and switching it on again? Maybe it uh, becomes better. Sure, I've just done that. Is this better? It's still appearing the same. Um, okay, let me just try. Okay, now it's better. Now it's clear. Yes. All right. So you were saying about your journey at Jindalubal Law School. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, I was just saying other than a prestigious law degree and some really great memories, I think uh, the important tool that I was given by JGLS was understanding the philosophy and policy of law before reading it to apply it. And uh, I think uh, even, to, even till today, it helps me when I approach the law, my clients or my colleagues. And the second important thing was the upbringing in law, in, in Jindal Global Law School for me was very holistic. Uh, not only did it educate me for legal education, but it also educated me on many other aspects of my life. It helped me open up uh, to becoming something more than I was when I entered the law school. I understood society in a different uh, frame, which was which I think uh, has helped me a lot in my career as a lawyer and also as a human being. I'm sure your inquisitive nature and your willingness to learn also added to uh, your skills as a lawyer and especially as a law student with this. I remember you as a remarkable student with a lot of academic uh, credentials. Um, so how did you decide on making a practice out of investment funds? Because uh, when uh, if I recall my law school journey, I don't think I had a single internship in investment funds or we would go more for these human rights internships or internships in international organizations or at max we would uh, uh, we would intern in a corporate law firm or something. So did you have the experience of interning uh, in this practice group before uh, graduating or how is it that you got into the practice of investment funds? Sure. So, uh, Shireen, I lost you for a little bit there, but uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? So, should I repeat myself? So, I was just asking you, Nandini, that how did you get into the practice of investment funds? What was your first experience? Did you undergo any internship while you were a law student or was it something that you pursued straight out, out of graduation? Right. So, uh, I think uh, for me, I I chose the law firm first and then the practice area came, came second. I interned in a lot of places and I realized that I was most comfortable at uh, Nisha Desai Associates. And then I figured if I'm comfortable with the firm, then whichever practice area that I work in at this firm, I will be happy. Uh, at the time that I joined the firm, I was asked to join in the investment funds practice area because that's where they needed the workforce. Uh, and 
I have not looked back ever since because this is such a niche practice area that uh, you are finding new questions and then answers to those questions every day. Uh, it only gets more interesting. It's dynamic. It's evolving. Uh, so I just I I think that the between the first day and today, I've never really wanted to step out of the practice area. Okay, I can imagine that working in a firm of the repute of Nishidasa Associates, which is an international law firm with offices in India and abroad, comes with a lot of cross-border work and international work. Uh, it must be challenging as well. But what is the most exciting uh, part of your profession and what are you most looking forward uh, in your professional life? So, like I said, Shireen, the... Um, the practice area is evolving as I am growing as a lawyer uh, in parallel. So I'm just trying to keep up with the progress in the field, sometimes trying to get ahead of the curve, uh, but mostly just trying to keep up with with the field and its, its progress. I'm hoping that uh, I continue to keep up, maybe write more about uh, this practice area and the new questions, legal, commercial, or a combination of the two that come up during my journey. Okay, so the, you have a lot in store for all of us interested in the area of investment funds. So now coming to the topic for today's webinar, how did you go about choosing this topic? I'm sure there are so many things that you would have been able to discuss with all of us, but what, what made you choose the topic for today? Sure. So um, I would actually request if I can share my screen. Uh, I have some visual aid to help answer this question. Um, but uh, while that happens, I think just why I chose this topic was simple because uh, I think the practice area is not commonly known among uh, budding lawyers or existing lawyers in the country, while it is a uh, very well-known practice area among among lawyers globally. Uh, it is, I, I don't know if people have watched the Showtime uh, drama Billions, but uh, that show did definitely add to the awareness of investment funds as a practice area for lawyers all over the country. Um, other than that, uh, I think uh, Nishid Bhai, uh, Mr. Nishid Desai, as we fondly call him, Nishid, Nishad Bhai has been a pioneer in this uh, in this practice area for over 35 years now, and uh, we do have a lot of uh, thought leadership uh, articles and uh, a lot of master classes on this subject area for people who are interested. But I thought, let me take this opportunity to talk to uh, a webinar organized by my alma mater on uh, how this practice area can be a career option for lawyers. Yes, that sounds very interesting. I would just want to check with the attendees if the video and the audio is clear for you. Uh, you can uh, put in your responses in the chat uh, box so that we understand that uh, communication is clear between us. Because I am getting a few uh, queries about the audio not coming through. So I just wanted to know if it's clear. Okay, great, great. So I've got a thumbs up from our audience. Uh, our videos and audios are clear, Nandini, so that's a relief for us. So, uh, Unkar, can you please share the, um, share, uh, give Nandini that option to share her screen so that all of us can look at her uh, presentation? Sorry, I lost you there for a second. Okay, can you just I will uh, Nandini, did, uh, have you got the prompt to share your screen? I have, yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, all right. Uh, so, there are certain things. Um, Shireen, I think I've lost you. 
Uh, Omkar, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Uh, you can continue. Uh, Shireen just went on offline. I guess she is also facing some internet issue. So you can just continue with your presentation. Sure. Great. Thanks. You can so turn your I... webcam off and just continue with your presentation. So we can do that. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Omkar. Okay, so while Shireen joins us, I think uh, it is important for us to first understand what an investment fund really is. Um, to, to help you understand the meaning of an investment fund, I'm just going to try to break it down into simpler terms. I would like to think of an investment fund as an entity which pools monies from different people and invests those monies into different investment opportunities. So let's spend some time here on what I just said. I said a few key things. Key one was there has to be an entity. Key two was the entity has to pull monies from different people. Key three is that the entity should solely be investing. Now, given these three key items for us to identify an investment fund. Let's try and look at the structure of what an investment fund scheme looks like. So we have a fund. We have people who want to pull monies into the fund. Let's call them investors because they are effectively investing into the fund. And the fund is going to make investments. Now, I don't want you to get lost in unnecessarily complicated jargon. So let me simplify what I mean here by portfolio asset. Portfolio is nothing but simply a term used for grouping or collection. Like, you know, in case of artists, you call their, uh, port their work a portfolio of their work, right? It's just the same. For a fund, it is a portfolio of securities or a portfolio of assets. Um, I hope you can still see my screen. Onkar, uh, is the PPT still uh, uh, visible? Yeah, yes. please continue. All right, great. So, um, and the second thing, asset, is uh, simply something that can be owned or controlled to produce value. So a portfolio of assets would simply mean uh, the assets that the fund is holding uh, across different uh, uh different spectrums and a collection of them is a portfolio now when i first saw this structure a lot of questions came to my mind i think back in my in the first month of uh when i joined the the law firm uh, i i began to wonder why do these investors want to come together and pool their monies if they have the money to invest why can't they just simply directly invest this seemed more like a business question to me so I thought, hey, as a lawyer, it's none of my business to ask business questions. So I tried to move on. But with time, you will realize that as lawyers, it's very important for us to understand the business of our clients to be able to give them holistic legal advice. So I was directed back to my original question of why do these investors come together and pool their monies? How do they even know each other? Are they friends? Are all investors of all investment funds actually just friends or family who know each other? When I dug deep into this, I figured I was missing a very important element of an investment fund, which is the fund manager. Now, this fund, this fund is actually the brainchild of the fund manager. It is the job of the fund manager to come up with an investment thesis, go to different investors to raise monies from them using its investment thesis, which is an idea, pulling their monies together, and then investing those monies in different portfolio opportunities as per its investment thesis. So this entire scheme is actually something that is designed by the fund manager. Now, uh, the fund manager is actually um, responsible for uh, providing an investment management service to the fund and to the investors. So if I were to put investment funds in an industry or in a sector, 
I would put it in the financial services sector because a financial service is in fact being provided by the fund manager to the fund and to the investors. So this was the first question and I was quite relieved to be able to figure something out. The second question that came to my mind was why does it have to be an entity? Why does an investment fund need to be an entity? Uh, why can't it just be a bank account where everyone is just pooling their money? Like, you know, as childhood, uh, in childhood, we would have piggy banks where uh, us or our siblings or our cousins would just pool in money together in that to buy something. Why do we need a legal entity? Well, with time, I realized that if and when there is money involved, there are rights and obligations created. So here, the investors were actually entrusting their money with the fund manager to make investments, and that would give, right, give rise to certain rights and obligations. There is another level in this whole fund structure where money is involved, right? The fund is using the monies it has pooled to invest into different portfolio assets. So there are rights and obligations being created between the fund and these assets. To be able to record legal rights and obligations, to be able to enforce them, we need a legal entity which can sue and which can be sued. So a bank account, which is merely a financial identity, cannot serve the purpose for us. So we need a legal entity. Now, this legal entity can have the, the bank account in which the monies will come in from different investors and the account, the bank account will actually be in the name of this fund. The legal entity that we use for a fund can be of different types. It can be a trust, a limited liability partnership, or a company. Actually, it can be a body corporate, or it can be just a limited partnership, depending on the country we are looking at and the commercials that we are dealing with, or rather the fund manager is dealing with. So um, this is broadly how uh, I would think an investment fund can be defined. Given the, the scheme of these things, you, you might think, oh, we do have some investment funds in the country right now. We have mutual funds which follow this. We have infrastructure investment trusts. We have real estate investment trusts, and we have alternative investment funds. So these are different kinds of investment funds in India that an investment funds lawyer might have to deal with. Um, Shireen, are you back on? Yes, Nandini, I'd lost uh, connection for a few minutes. And thank you for uh, introducing us to the basics of investment funds. And now I think uh, all of us are ready to understand the legal framework uh, that governs investment funds in India. I'm sure it's complicated and there's uh, many aspects to it. But if you would like to break it down for us, that what are the broad laws that apply to investment funds in India? Sure. Thanks. So let me try uh, giving that a shot. I what I have here is a typical fund structure that we discussed. Now you might think, why do we need a separate set of laws to govern a fund? We just discussed it is set up as an entity. If it is a trust, it will be governed by the Indian Trusts Act. If it is a company, the Companies Act will govern it. If it is an LLP, then we have the LLP Act of 2008. We really don't need new set of laws. Uh, to govern this entity. So, fair enough, these laws do govern the entity itself, but there is something more to this entity than just existing as a legal form. There are two key activities which are taking place with respect to this fund, which is related to its fund manager. The two activities are a marketing, the marketing activity by the fund manager of marketing the fund, and the investment decision making activity of deciding where the monies are to be invested. Now let's look at these activities one by one. What is the first activity of marketing? The fund manager is actually coming, coming up with an idea. For example, let's say the idea is, I know the five best startups in agrotech industry who will do very well in the next 10 years if they could get the money that they want right now and the money will grow over next 10 years well enough for investors who have invested into that 
that portfolio of uh, uh, startups to get a nice appreciated value over time. So the fund manager decides to use this knowledge about these startups, which only the fund manager has using its own expertise, its investment analysis tools, its deal sourcing abilities, its relationships with these different startups, various different factors. It uses all of these as a business proposal and goes to these investors who happen to have monies to invest. Now, these investors can be of different types. These investors can be family houses. These investors can be high net worth individuals or just individuals like you and me. Or these can be um, institutional investors. These can be insurers. There are different types of investors which exist. All these investors have set aside a certain pool of money which they want to use only towards investing. So their money makes more money. The fund manager goes to these investors with its business proposal, takes the idea of a fund and tells them, hey, instead of all the other investment opportunities that you have, why don't you consider investing in these startups that I have chosen, which by the way, can over the period of, over a period of next 10 years, give you appreciated returns, which you would not get if you were to use this money to invest directly, stand alone into these separate entities. Uh, or you may not even find the right mix of entities to invest into. Now, whenever someone is telling me to use my money a particular way, I will be suspicious, right? It is my money. I have saved it. I want to invest it carefully. It is when we are talking about investor protection, there is one, regu one regulatory entity that comes to our minds in India which is the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Similarly, in other jurisdictions, we have securities market regulators of those countries which try to regulate how people are being told to manage their own monies so that savings are rightly utilized and are not misled into investments or investment-like transactions which can have a spillover effect on the economy. So the Securities and Exchange Board of India steps in and says, hold on, if you want to go to people and tell them how to invest their money, I want to be able to supervise it. And that's where the Securities and Exchange Board of India, which was set up under the SEBI Act of 1992, has come up with these different regulations, mutual fund regulations, AIF regulations, INVIT regulations, street regulations. These regulations govern different kinds of funds which are being set up uh, in India. In addition to this, there is also an investment decision making activity, the second activity that I spoke of. The fund manager is not only required to exercise uh, good, good, uh, good faith while raising money from investors, but it is also required to exercise a fiduciary obligation towards their money once they have all agreed to give their money to the manager. The manager is required to ensure that it is not using the money to simply invest in family or friends enterprises or related party entities, which are really not yielding any profitable uh, returns for these investors, whether in the short term or in the long term. While the investors would have agreed to a risk of loss of their money, they would not have agreed to it indefinitely or without any um without any uh, limitations they would want to they would want to require the fund manager to exercise their fiduciary obligations now uh, these regulations that i have laid out these regulations cover these obligations of the fund manager cover different types of uh, fund governance mechanisms also covers one basic uh, requirement of how much do you need to invest as an investor to participate in this type of a fund? So for an AIF, for example, the minimum amount of investment that you can make is one crore Indian rupees. The reason for that is you have to have the risk appetite of investing in an entity of this kind so that if there is a risk of loss of capital, the spillover effects on the economy are not large, among other reasons. So uh, these regulations 
look at the marketing activity investment decision making activity and also the governance of the fund largely to ensure that in addition to the indian trust act or other regulations which incorporate the fund there is a regulatory body looking at the specific activity which is being carried out by this fund there is one more angle to this what if these investors are from outside india well in that case uh, obviously the reserve bank of india would be interested in flow of money right uh, i'm sure you're aware whenever we are receiving a foreign investment into india we look at the foreign direct investment policy so why is it that if these investors are coming to through a through an investment fund and then investing into different companies uh they would not have to look at foreign exchange management act well they would have to while there are certain specific uh, uh certain automatic uh routes allowed with respect to investments in investment funds those are not unfettered and there are limits limitations attached to them so as a lawyer who's structuring a fund for a fund manager where there are overseas investors you would have to look at different regulations under the foreign exchange management act and how do they apply so um i think this is as broad a coverage that i can provide in a very little time on the laws which govern investment funds shireen yes nandini that was a good overview of the regulatory and the legal framework governing investment funds in india and it was literally like a master class on the laws and uh, the regulatory aspects of investment funds in india so thank you for that uh, before i move on to the uh, next question i would like to make an announcement for all our attendees that we'll be taking questions uh, towards the end of the webinar and you could meanwhile type in your questions in the chat box given on the right hand side of the your screen and at the end we'll be happy to uh, take up as many questions as time permits so now nandini we are going to take a sneak peek into your work day and we would like to understand that uh, what does a work day in the life of an invest investment funds lawyer looks like so we would like to understand the kind of clients that you deal with the scope of your work and probably one or two interesting incidents that might have happened uh, during your professional journey so uh, tell us more about your work there sure so uh, i'm sorry but i will keep going back to this structure because it's the easiest to explain this with structures uh, let me start by telling you how a lawyer can help different counterparties involved in a fund structure let's start with the fund manager i don't mean to insinuate anything but i think this uh, icon best depicts a funds lawyer so this this icon wherever i show it to you is supposed to be a lawyer an investment funds lawyer so if you were representing a fund ma manager as a lawyer the first step for you would be to structure the fund the fund manager will come to you with an idea like i discussed earlier an idea of say five startups in the agrotech industry who will do very well for the next 10 years and i want to raise money to invest into these five startups i have investors from four different jurisdictions and also some investors in india so how do i go about this so while assisting them uh, with fund structuring as a lawyer you need to keep into mind different things first what is the kind of fund that is being looked at so like i said venture capital investments right because these are investments in startups so you would obviously rule out uh, uh, other investment fund structures that are available and you would look at trying to structure it as a venture capital fund similarly uh, you would look at what the fund manager intends to where the fund manager intends to operate from is it from india is it from outside india and that's how you will design the fund manager service uh, that the fund manager is going to provide to the fund with respect to investors coming from different jurisdictions you will have to take into account uh, the tax uh, arrangements that those investors would have vis-a-vis -vis the fund so the double taxation avoidance agreements and how the fund will provide uh,
tax neutrality to these investors are conversations that you might need to have at the fund structuring stage as a lawyer to your fund manager client the second uh, step in 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 the course of legal advice to a fund manager is with respect to fundraising so for fundraising let me first tell you what fundraising would mean fundraising would mean that the fund manager has now decided a skeletal structure after discussing with its lawyers it has its own business idea in mind it is going to combine its business idea and the skeletal structure and it will go to investors to pitch when it goes to the investors the process is called fundraising because you're trying to raise monies for your fund so uh when the fund manager is going to different investors situated in different jurisdictions with its pitch the regulators in those jurisdictions who are the equivalent of sebi in india so for example the securities exchange commission in the us would want to first look at your activity and understand whether what you're doing is legit right so the fund manager cannot just simply go to the us talk to 10 different investors take their money and come into india it's a regulated activity so uh, for let's take us a only for example so the fund manager suppose in india has to go to the us to pitch to certain investors the sec looks at it as a regulated activity and the sec requires that you register yourself with sec in the us to carry out such an activity unless you are falling under the exemption that the sec has laid out so one of the exemptions that the sec in the us has laid out is if you are an accredited investor then uh, sorry if you are pitching to an accredited investor and you're pitching only to accredited investors then i can excuse you from my regulatory purview go ahead and raise from those investors because these accredited investors are sophisticated enough self sufficient enough to understand the risk that risks that will be involved in an investment of this kind so uh, that is an available exemption for fundraising but fund managers are usually not aware of what can be uh, legal concerns arising when they go out and they, they freely talk to investors and that's where we kick in as their legal counsel this uh, this is a legal aspect of fundraising at the raising stage itself there is one more long term thinking you have to do as a lawyer for your fund manager you have to ensure that their pitch is misrepresentation proof so there are sufficient uh, disclaimers in place or there is there is sufficient safeguard for the fund manager while it is pitching to the investors from a futuristic claim that investors may raise against the manager for say misrepresentation or guaranteed returns which were never intended or so on and so forth moving on the first two steps are done the third step is the most critical and exciting step uh, for me for sure is negotiations with the investors so the investors will get their own lawyers you are uh, representing the fund manager as a client and you negotiate on the terms of investment now this in itself is a very engaging exercise because the investors and the fund managers are supposed to be aligned in that their monies should be invested in a high uh, high return making risk adjustment investments and it it is something that the fund manager also benefits from commercially i will not go into those discussions right now but that is how the business model works so the negotiations between investors and the fund manager which are led by the lawyers more often than not are very interesting then there is tax structuring that i discussed about and then there is a profit stru sharing structure for the fund manager that you look at so assuming the fund manager itself would have some individuals at the back right maybe it's a team of five people who have come together to manage money between those five people there will be inter se rights and obligations which is like i said money so rights and obligations come in as plus ones as the fund manager's lawyer you would also need to take care of the profit sharing structure between those people behind the fund manager so that's how a lawyer for a fund manager works out a, a lawyer for the fund manager usually also becomes a lawyer for the fund 
because like I said, the fund is actually a brainchild of the fund manager. And as a lawyer of the fund, your limited job is to drafting the fund documents and also later in life, maybe provide advice with respect to governance of the fund as and when prompted by either the investors or the fund manager. But the initial step is to draft the fund documents. These fund documents would uh, involve to begin with the charter document of the entity. So if it's an LLP, you will have to do an LLP agreement. If it's a trust, you will have to do a trust deed. If it's a company, you will have to do an article. Uh, you'll have to do a memorandum of association and articles of association. So uh, uh, other than setting up the entity itself, what you need to draft most critically is actually the private placement memorandum of the fund. Now this terminology of private placement memorandum is something that you will hear shortly known as PPM across different uh, practitioners, law firms, investment fund uh, professionals. PPM is basically a marketing document which the fund is issuing to its potential investors to invite monies into the fund. Now this PPM contains everything that uh, you would want to know as a potential investor about the fund as an investment product. The PPM will tell you what the risks are. The PPM will tell you what the key fund terms are for investing in the fund. Uh, it's like a brochure you would get when you're buying a flat, you know, uh, to, to give a very, very crude uh, uh, metaphor. So it would give you everything you need to know about making the investment that you're about to make and this is drafted by the lawyers because a lot of careful uh, drafting goes in there a lot of safeguards a lot of disclaimers a lot of risk factors legal considerations tax considerations go into this document next is uh, how you would serve uh, as a lawyer to a sponsor now I have not discussed this term sponsor earlier, but basically a sponsor of a fund is someone who takes the bet on the fund, who is uh, giving confidence to all the other investors that I am taking, uh, I'm making an investment in the fund. I am putting my skin into the game. So you should also feel comfortable putting your monies into the fund. In fact, I promise to not take out my investment until all of you have been given your investments out of the fund. I will continue to keep my money logged into the fund until the fund is operating. That's my token of uh, demonstration to you that my skin is in the game. The sponsor is usually uh, related to the fund manager and they work in tandem, but it can be a third third party acting in goodwill, uh, which truly believes in the idea of the fund. So if you're acting as a counsel to the sponsor, then again, you would have, if you're separate from the fund manager, you would have to negotiate with the fund manager and also the other investors, which I have forgotten to write. You would have to review the fund documents that the fund council would have drafted from a sponsor's perspective. You would have to structure their tax uh, tax aspects with respect to the fund and their profit sharing with the fund manager, if any, for them to be acting as sponsor to the fund. Next is acting as a fund as a counsel to an investor who is investing in the fund this is pretty straightforward but a lot of fun indeed uh, where you get to negotiate with the fund manager's lawyer where you get to review documents which are drafted by another lawyer and where you also get to do tax structuring with respect to your investors investment into the fund if the fund is set up in the form of a trust then there might be a trustee also involved if the trustee is involved, you might be appointed as a lawyer for the trustee where you would need to negotiate with the fund manager and the investors. You would need to review fund documents and you might need to engage in some tax related discussions, perhaps not structuring. So this, I believe, is a broad uh, overview again of the kind of work you would interface uh, with as a lawyer in this practice area, Shireen. Yes, Nandini, uh, that was very interesting to hear and uh, it seems like a major part of your work is to firstly understand all the uh, legal aspects of a 
and the regulatory aspects of a particular deal and then to sort of simplify it to your clients and i'm sure that would have been a task for you to simplify the law to uh, business people that is always challenging uh, now my next question to you is and we have a lot of questions and i'm eager to get to them uh, the final question in terms of the lecturing aspect of this uh, webinar is that if someone wants to begin practicing in the area of investment funds or is looking to better their practice or scale up their practice in this area, then what are some of the ways in which uh, a person can pursue the practice of investment funds? Sure. So I think um, the most important thing is understanding securities laws as a subject area. Like I said in the beginning of uh, our discussion that the philosophy matters a lot. So understand the why and then the regulatory framework or where you can find different things if your client is asking you for a legal question. Second is understanding foreign exchange laws. Uh, this is also again, if, I, if it were me, I would follow the approach of understanding the philosophy and getting into then getting into the legal aspects. Knowledge of finance and accounting helps. Now, take it from me, I am a maths and science uh, student back from school. Uh, when I entered law school, I was really just trying to understand the law. Uh, we did not get uh, bogged down by commercial terms because the faculty was kind enough to break it down to us, keeping in mind we all come from different majors. But when I joined uh, the law firm, it became necessary for me to understand some finance and accounting terms. Until date, I have to go back to uh, commerce books from maybe class 11 or 12, which are available online for me to read and understand basics. Uh, it's, it's not a must, but it helps uh, for a holistic legal advice. And it would help if you miscellaneously read uh, how investment analysis works, how do people create deals, uh, what is in the news about funds, different kinds of funds, in mutual funds, REITs, INVITS, AIFs, different types of funds. Uh, so these are some things that I thought could help. Other than this, uh, Shireen, I had also put down some basic terms, but I think given the paucity of time and also, I have discussed some of these during earlier slides. We can skip the basic terms. OK. Uh, that sounds about right. And probably we could share it with the uh, audience uh, later on after the webinar, if uh, some of them are sure. interested in to go through the terms. So uh, thank you for so many questions. There are a number of questions, Nandini, uh, for you today. and. Uh, we starting with the uh, question by Professor Khagesh Kotham, who is a professor at Jindal Global Law School. And uh, so Professor Khagesh Kotham has a question about regulation that whether SEBI should be uh, regulating investment funds at all. So what is your view on regulators uh, uh, coming into the space and limiting what investment funds can do? Sure. First, it's great to hear from you, Professor. I hope you're doing well. Um, so there is an ongoing debate in the industry on whether SEBI should regulate the fund manager or the fund, because it is really the fund manager's activities that are uh, that are to be regulated by SEBI. But for some reason, SEBI has taken the call that it will regulate the investment fund itself, because investment fund is in fact, the financial intermediary uh, whose performance could have a spillover effect in the securities market. So I think that's the rationale that they use for uh, regulating the investment fund itself. But there is a debate and there is a dialogue with the regulator where people are trying to convince SEBI to change it to regulation of the fund manager. OK, uh, that sounds uh, interesting. Our next question is from Vishal Rajvansh. He said that the Indian government uh, has brought in certain changes to the FTA policies. Uh, 
uh, while this is evident uh, that the policy change affects the most, Pluto has termed policy change as a violation of WTO norms. What are your views on it? So in a nutshell, uh, they change the FDI policy and uh, it is uh, disproportionately, uh, disproportionately affecting China. And what do you think uh, are your views on uh, this kind of an amendment? So yes, again, uh, there is a, a, a lot of dialogue out there about this amendment. Uh, I think uh, if you look at it from a policy perspective, uh, which I would, uh, it is a necessity right now. That's obviously my personal analysis on the situation. Uh, if you look at it from a legal perspective, then again, uh, the government has sufficient leeways that it needs to come out with uh, a circular of this sort uh, to amend the FDI policy. Uh, if you remember the days or if you've read about the days of uh, FERA, which was there before FEMA, uh, in any case, foreign direct investment into India was highly regulated and then it was liberated by the government. So it is always a domestic call uh, for us to determine who are we allowing in. Yes, of course. Uh, there's a question from Shiran Shivasta who said that can you suggest some examples for investment schemes apart from those in mutual fund scheme? So uh, basically examples of investment schemes uh, more and above the mutual fund schemes that exist. Sure. So there can be, uh, like I discussed during the webinar, there can be venture capital funds, there can be private equity funds, there can be real estate investment trusts, it can be infrastructure investment trusts. So it truly depends on your investment thesis as a fund manager. Uh, also, if if I if I understood your question correctly, I think you were talking about other investment schemes. So that would mean not only other investment funds, but other investment uh, opportunities. So there are also uh, SEBI investment advisors regulations and SEBI research analysis regulations which are introduced by SEBI, where uh, instead of actually creating an investment fund, you can simply just uh, provide investment advice to different investors about which stocks should they invest into or which, uh, uh, which entities uh, should they invest into or which sector should they invest into. That's, that's where you would get covered as an investment analyst. And research uh, analysts also uh, provide, sorry, investment advisor. And research analysts also provide uh, uh, research data on movement of different stocks and different securities and different investment for, for funds and how they, they are performing. Uh, that is also a regulated activity because you don't want to mislead investors with your research data. Other than these, there is a portfolio management scheme launched by SEBI uh, where you become a registered portfolio manager with SEBI and you manage accounts of each investor on a separately managed account basis. So that is another investment scheme that is possible. Thank you, Nandini. So Another interesting question that has come up from the attendees is by uh, Shreyan Srivastava. Uh, interestingly, uh, they want us to throw some light on the Lakshmi Chit Fund or the Sharda scam and what were certain limitations or loopholes in the law that such scams could happen uh, in India and should foreign investments in India be regulated by an independent agency like SEBI? Uh, sorry, that is that is the question you already dealt with. But the question really that I'm asking you now is asked of by Shri and Shivasta, is that whether uh, scams like Sharda and Lakshmi Chit Fund, what is it that you know makes them happen in our country? What are the legal loopholes uh, that allow for such scams to happen in this country? So the first legal loophole is, uh, I think, how we regulate fundraising. That's where it all begins in each of these scams. If you go back and you'll see uh, most of the investors are complaining about misrepresentation, right? So the loophole is not in actually catching the scammer and taking an action against the scammer. The loophole, the loophole is actually at the structuring stage as to why are these funds even coming into uh, effect? Shouldn't there be uh, some supervision over how these funds are being constituted? And that's where SEBI steps in uh, today. And SEBI makes sure that uh, you are 
marketing to people on a private placement basis in a confidential manner where you are designing a placement memorandum which has all the risk factors built in which also says what are the things that uh, that could lead to performance of the fund being different from the performance that you are actually demonstrating to your potential investors. So these are checks and balances that uh, I think our regulator has also evolved over time uh, to come up with to ensure that these funds don't even come into being to begin with. Um, forget about uh, you know raising issues against them later when the harm has already happened. Professor Khadir, you also had a related question on whether foreign investments should be regulated by SEBI or not. So I would like to rephrase that question saying that whether foreign investments should be uh, regulated by SEBI or not. And what were, what are your views in that regard? Are they similar to the question on investment funds or do you think um, there should be further limitations? Sure. So um, there are uh, two reasons why uh, foreign invest uh, two different types of regulations that uh, we impose on foreign investors looking at India. One is from a foreign exchange perspective because money is flowing from an outside source to India, which is taken care of by the Reserve Bank. There is another mm -hmm. angle to it, which is a securities market uh, angle. Now, SEBI's uh, prerogative here is to ensure as a securities market regulator that foreign investors should not come in and disturb the volatility of the securities markets in India. So SEBI therefore has come up with uh, regulations on foreign portfolio investors or foreign venture capital investors where it regulates the kind of foreign investment that can come in in certain types of securities in India uh, in the securities market and how are they required to report to SEBI from time to time about their investments and about movement and positions uh, and how they are trying to exit from these investments, etc. Uh, this is an interesting question from one of the attendees. According to uh, uh, the, the question really is that we know about the recent stake that China has bought in HDFC. So uh, his question uh, in this regard is that do you think it, it could pose a problem for control over unicorn industries, uh, mainly startups in India, uh, such a sort of investment in HDFC? What are the what is the fallout for startups in India in this regard? Sorry, that seems like a business question to me, which is way beyond my legal knowledge. So I, I'm just going to skip over that. But, but yeah, I, I think uh, there is enough written about it just to just to touch upon it. Uh, uh, th there is very little you can do to prevent uh, spillover effects on the industry uh, with these foreign investments. But that is where the regulator steps in and imposes uh, regulatory limits. You know, For example, a foreign portfolio investor cannot invest uh, beyond a certain percentage in each company in India. Or uh, an AIF or an alternative investment fund is required to diversify its investments across different companies where it cannot invest more than a certain percentage in a particular company. So I think diversification and imposing uh, investment limits on foreign investors, the combination of the two, is a helpful tool to prevent spillover effects. But uh, uh, even after that, what happens is something that the regulator will, would have to evolve with these incidents and come up with solutions okay that's a fair enough answer good enough more than a business person i guess and i think uh, you deal with a lot of business in your uh, lawyer work as opposed to many business people i guess so uh, now a question has come from uh, sarmad ahmed uh, his question really is about uh, how uh, important is international investment law in the practice of investment funds in india and whether there is certain uh, harmonizing of laws happening uh, with the international landscape of laws when we deal with investment funds so how important is the, how important is the knowledge of international investment funds and how it is being harmonized in the indian landscape sorry uh, did you say international investment law or international investment funds I said international investment law. I meant international oh. law. Yes. 
Okay, so uh, I think by that we mean the bilateral investment protection treaties largely. Uh, these treaties are helpful for sovereigns against sovereigns, uh, and these treaties come into uh, don't really uh, meddle a lot when it comes to private investments. Uh, these come into effect only when there is, uh, for example, uh, I'm sure people would have been reading about sovereign wealth funds and how these sovereign funds may also have investments from other sovereigns across the globe. Uh, when there are there is a conflict between these sovereigns over investment funds, then definitely the bilateral investment protection treaties would kick in in the context of investment funds and would be helpful. Uh, but other than that, uh, I think each investment fund has to adhere with the laws of its incorporation uh, with respect to its operations. And when you're fundraising, like I said, you have to go to laws of different jurisdictions wherever you're raising from. So uh, a Canada would be worried about citizens of Canada and how you're taking their money out of Canada and so on and so forth. Okay. That's a nice insight into uh, international investment law. Uh, another attendee of ours, Anushri Uttarwar, has a question to deal with, uh, deals with the practical aspects of investment funds. So she wants to know whether securities lawyers uh, deal with investment funds, in that, and if so, to what extent? And the second part of her question is, how important is the knowledge of finance when it comes to the practice of investment funds? Okay, so to answer the first question, uh, a lawyer in the investment funds practice area is supposed to understand securities laws, uh, mainly because it it operates in the realm of investments uh, as as a as an activity, financial investments as an activity. So yes, a securities an investment funds council should know securities law, but a securities lawyer need not necessarily do investment funds. Uh, because that's up to your choice, you know. And uh, the second uh, question that you asked, uh, like I said earlier during the uh, webinar, during the presentation, that an understanding of finance and accounting helps. Uh, you can always read about concepts on a piecemeal basis as and when they cross your path. So perhaps you don't need to understand the meaning of profit and loss uh, statement and balance sheets unless you come across them uh, while while reading a private placement memorandum or uh, the pitch of a fund manager who has just come to you. Uh, you can read it as and when it does, or you can have a holistic understanding of finance and accounts in your leisurely time so that whenever you cross these paths, you don't have to go back to the books and you already know what you're dealing with. Okay. So uh, another set of questions, and I'm going to club all of those questions, are to do with really the job opportunities, especially in these exceptional times that we are in. Job opportunities in the practice area of investment funds, and how large are these teams in law firms that deal with investment funds practice? Sorry, how large are these? The teams of, for investment fund practice uh, in law firms that usually what is the size of the uh, that would hiring, hiring, so that's why. <laughs> sure, of course. So, so yeah, I think, uh, like I said, the practice area is only coming up in India. I don't think every law firm in the country has this practice area. It's highly specialized and niche. Uh, hiring is, uh, I, I think, different law firms would work differently. Uh, and what is the workforce that you need depends on the clients clientele that you have to deal with. Uh, so those are all subjective questions. But, um, but one thing is for sure that if if you want to work in this practice area, then you have to uh, be OK with trying to deal with different areas of law at the same time. You need to be able to interact with uh, a disputes lawyer with ease or say a m &A lawyer with ease because all of these different uh, fields of law or different practice areas of law would intersect with your daily work as an investment funds lawyer because your manager, your manager clients are going to want a holistic advice regarding both fundraising and fund investments. So um, 
so if if you want to be a part of investment funds practice area it's not too bad to start from another practice area and then switch that is also absolutely fine but uh, you need to be comfortable with being nimble okay and what are those practice areas that you would suggest uh, for switching into investment fa uh, funds practice later on uh regulatory uh m a uh there could also be uh, capital markets because capital markets lawyers work a lot on uh, the red herring prospectus and disclosure documents so ppms would come in as a comfortable piece of things for them uh and uh, there could be it could be any uh, field actually uh, even a disputes lawyer could always choose to switch gears to an investment funds uh, practice area and there's a question about uh, how often do investment funds lawyers switch practice areas and if they do then uh, what are those practice areas that they switch to maybe doing investment funds full time is that something uh, which is considered a common practice in this field i doubt that it is <laughs> i am hoping that it will be uh, i don't think uh, a lot of people have spent time uh, you know obviously there, there you can name a handful of lawyers in the country who have spent a lot of time in this practice area uh, but not as many as you litigators you would find or not as many uh, uh, I mean, or uh, project finance lawyers uh, that you would find. Relatively, it's a lower number. Uh, but uh, you you could switch from different sub areas within, say, corporate within the corporate transactions team. There could be sub areas depending on the sectors that they focus on or the kind of strategies that they focus on. Similarly, in a disputes team, you can have different subsets, right? You could have arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism. You could only have company law disputes. You could only have, uh, you, you know, uh, matters with respect to electricity board. So there can be different subsets uh, if you want to create a specialization uh, within a sector. Okay, that is interesting. And what do you think uh, is the mindset of these international law firms? Uh, do they prefer hiring uh, Indian lawyers who have expertise in investment funds? Is that something which uh, is commonly seen within the circles? Right, so I, I would think I actually had an opportunity to be at a foreign law firm at some point, but that was not in the investment funds practice area. So I can't speak from my own experience. Uh, but a very good friend of mine who was in the investment funds practice area actually went on to uh, do his uh, master's uh, in a foreign law university and then joined a couple of law firms one after the other uh, in their investment funds practice areas and uh, enjoyed his work while he was there. So uh, I think it is possible for foreign law firms to pick up Indian investment funds legal professionals, but there may be a requirement to get a local law uh, qualification depending on the country we are talking about. Okay, and what do you think are the best uh, countries in terms of uh, model laws and regulations uh, with respect to investment funds outside India? What are the hot destinations for investment funds uh, if somebody wants to look it up and uh, develop more knowledge in this field? So I would say, uh, of course, the US, the UK, uh, there is uh, Hong Kong, Japan, Netherlands, uh, Mauritius, Singapore. Um, yeah, these were just off the top of my mind. Okay, good to know. So now we have a lawyer with us, uh, fellow lawyer Aparna Raman, who is an independent uh, legal practitioner and practices in the area of investment law and FTA laws. Uh, hi, Aparna. Your qu uh, her question for Nandini is that what are your thoughts on the adequacy of due diligence? Adequacy of due diligence of the source of funds for investment and the second question is how ubos can be identified for foreign investors with multiple complex legal and tax structures did you get the question andani it's quite a handful 
sorry i your voice was in and out shreen uh okay. So I'll repeat the first part of the question. The first part of the question that Aparna is posing to you is to do with the adequacy of due diligence of the source of funds for investment. How adequate do you, do you think is the due diligence done when it comes to the source of funds uh, for investment? What are your views on that? Okay, I I think I think I uh, I hear what you're saying. Hi, Aparna. So um, basically. Uh, I think there are a lot of KYC norms in place with respect to uh, investments and investment funds that the fund manager is obligated to undertake. Uh, along with that, uh, there are also uh, private due diligences carried out by the fund manager on these investors. There are representations taken by these fund managers from these investors on their source of funds. Uh, which the manager can act upon or enforce against these investors if tomorrow there was a question raised against the manager on the source of these funds. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, I, I, I think that is how the adequacy of uh, due diligence is covered both in statutory terms and privately. Okay, perfect. And now she has an additional question about how UBOs can be identified for foreign investors with multiple complex legal and tax structures. So the second question is to do with UBOs and the complex legal and tax structures governing them. So how do you identify them for foreign investors? Yes, so that actually takes up a good part of our time as investment lawyers when you have to break through different structures and understand uh, how the law is trying to break through those structures it gets complicated where the definition of control is different for different kinds of entities uh, where uh, the ultimate beneficial owner is actually maybe five to six layers up and different jurisdictions have different kinds of legal forms in the middle so it is an exercise, but I think you have to be as technical as possible with respect to these items and you have to take a conservative approach uh, because the regulator is definitely uh, trying to get the maximum information uh, out of out of these structures. Okay, interesting. So there's a question by Shubham Patel about the impact of COVID-19 lockdown in the investment fund scenario in India. Are there any signs of slowdown in the flow of investments and uh, what are your views on this thing i'm guessing there are but in specific if there's any insight uh, that you would like uh, for us to know about sure so uh, because of the travel restrictions definitely fundraising has come to a standstill Whatever fund managers can uh, uh, can do online and through teleconferences, they are trying to pitch, but uh, nothing matches a face-to-face -face meeting and a discussion uh, that fund managers are traditionally uh, accustomed to when it comes to fundraising. Uh, other than that, even for from an investor's perspective, the investors want to conduct a due diligence on the physical office of the investment manager. They are, after all, giving sometimes millions, sometimes billions of uh, their monies to these fund managers. Uh, so they want to make sure that the fund manager actually has the infrastructure and the equipment to do the job that it is set out to do. And those sort of due diligences have come to a halt. So for funds which are at the raising stage, uh, those are seeing some slowness and their timelines have to be drawn. But funds which were up and running uh, before, sorry, it seems my audio connection is lost. We can hear you perfectly. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And the second thing is that uh, uh, when when it comes to existing funds, they are going about their business as is. In fact, some of their portfolio companies need some more. Nandini, we can't hear you. We've lost you. Nandini, we are unable to hear you. 
G and their investment thesis. We lost them about thirty seconds, so we couldn't hear what they were saying. It want to re allocate their corpus. Uh, Shireen, are you there? Yes, yes. Uh, we couldn't hear you in between. Uh, lost you, you there. So, would you want to repeat for about 30 seconds? We oh. couldn't hear you. Sure. Uh, I was just saying that the existing funds are actually uh, continuing with life hazards and maybe allocating extra cash to some of the portfolio companies because they need bridge financing or short term financing. And uh, some existing funds may be trying to reallocate their corpus to different sectors and different kinds of securities given the impact of COVID on the economy. Hmm. Definitely. And all of us are seeing impacts in multiple sectors and investment funds are not uh, saved from such kind of cyclical impacts on the economy. So there's a question about how much is the knowledge of tax uh, important or essential in your practice as a as an investment funds lawyer, does it really come into uh, picture? How often do you use it and how in depth uh, do you go into tax laws? So uh, imagine if you were uh, facing a client and the client was to while in the flow of conversation also happen to talk to you about taxes. You would not want the conversation to be halted where you have to refer to someone else or talk to someone else to come back. While that is completely acceptable, it's just a matter of choice. If you know taxes, uh, tax laws, and if you can understand tax laws, then you can at least carry on a conversation with your client while talking to them about the broader scheme of things that they have come to you for. Uh, of course, you need not become a tax expert to be an investment funds lawyer, but it definitely helps to understand tax laws. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, lawyers have to carry on conversations about the most bizarre thing somehow, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yes. and so better know your tax law if you want to practice investment funds. So, yeah. so uh, there's a question about, there's a technical question about the fiduciary relationship between a fund manager vis-a-vis -vis the fund and the investor. So I think Yashwardhan is trying to understand this uh, sort of relationship between the fund manager and the investment uh, investor and the fund. How does it really work and what kind of a relationship do they sort of share in legal parlance? Sure, thanks. So, um, so Yashwardhan, the, the violence every regulation use the term fiduciary. You don't really go into defining in detail what a fiduciary is. Uh, so we have to uh, seriously look at uh, ju jurisprudence in the form of uh, in the form of legal precedents, uh, case laws, written articles by authorities, books, uh, global precedents of similar common law jurisdictions to understand what fiduciary means. Uh, and there are a few uh, important elements of a fiduciary relationship. Uh, there is an assumption of trust. So uh, that is, I think, the key. Uh, you need to be able to establish a trust being created for a fiduciary uh, to take place. Now, this can actually be a legal trust under the trust set, or it can just be a deemed trust, even in the, in the form of a company. Uh, so fiduciary would be simply understood is uh, a duty to act in good faith, but there is a lot more nuance to it than just that. Yeah, of course. Uh, there's another question, and we'll uh, take the last two questions and uh, close sure. the session with so many of them. Uh, so Shreyas uh, would like to understand that you know there are so many dot com bubbles and uh, that lead to recession or there are bankers involved and uh, we have seen in the past that uh, it has the economy has taken a huge hit uh, in terms of certain people investing in certain funds and the investments not uh, getting the returns that were required and that has 
a sort of a ripple effect on economies all over the world. So his question really is that how, uh, what do you think is the role of law to limit uh, the uh, incidence of these bubbles busting at some point and having these uh, re repercussions on the economy which are purely devastating? So what do you think, how can the law uh, sort of prevent uh, certain things from happening? So I think the law can play a very uh, small role in regulating the, the economy's outcome. A lot of different factors go in, right? The political climate, the, the, uh, the mere fact that we are looking at a developing or a developed nation, uh, whether there is an ongoing pandemic. There can be so many different factors which impact an economy which the law can not really cater to, which is why we have the legal contract of enforcement or tends to cover any of these situations which are not uh, stipulated in black and white under law. It's like a catch-all phrase for all that is uncontrollable by uh, by human interactions. So I think force majeure is a very important legal tool uh, to try and cover situations which are ordinarily not covered under uh, legal statute. Yeah, very well. So the last question really is about, uh, and from the attendees, and there are a couple of more which we are unable to take up at this point because of the paucity of time, is really how do you select, the, or rather how important is it to select the right law firm uh, to enter the practice of uh, investment funds? And uh, what do you think are the internal dynamics between those teams and what impact would that have on your career progression in a particular law firm? So that's a highly, highly subjective question. I will try to answer it uh, as objectively as possible, uh, but I can only speak from my own experiences. Uh, so please allow me some objectivity. Uh, I think it is very important for you to be happy wherever you are. If you are in a law firm that makes you happy for various reasons, then uh, Working in any practice area will automatically become very easy for you. Team dynamics could be a factor in making you happy or could be a factor of taking away happiness from you. In either of the two cases, you need to weigh the pros and cons. The sum total of it should be your happiness. Uh, if, if you are entering a law firm which is, say, not very uh, uh known in market for its investment funds practice but that's what you want to do uh and are happy working in the law firm then maybe you can be the individual who takes the law firm to the next level for its investment funds practice because your happiness would lead to your productivity and better results for whoever your employer is that's just my view and that's a very, very balanced and well-rounded view, and I'm sure uh, attendees would be paying attention to that. Uh, so I want your quick closing remarks for two questions, which uh, sort of uh, interest all of our attendees in some way or the other. There are two questions. So the first one is, how should a student decide whether he or she should pursue a career in law? So for an aspirant of law, what are the key factors that one should take into account uh, for deciding to study law and then pursue a career in law and to uh, to just generally have an insightful uh, insight into whether that particular person is made for a career in law or not. So what are the uh, what are the criteria that they should come up with? And the second question that uh, I really have for you is uh, top three tips for a young lawyer uh, to prepare himself or herself for a career in law especially when it comes to the practice of investment funds. So we would quickly want your closing, closing remarks on these two questions. Wow, those are difficult questions for me to answer, <laughs> but I will try and make an attempt. Uh, on the first question, uh, I think I covered this initially when we started talking. Go to your core qualities. Uh, introspect about, ask yourself what is it that in your view, sets you aside from all the other people that you know. Uh, and then try to hone that. 
if you feel that your core qualities lead you to becoming a good lawyer as someone who would uh, add to betterment of human species from a lawyer's perspective then i think that is what you should do that's your calling i think my my personal view is that all of us should approach our careers as uh, somehow being able to evolve human species into the next level you don't need to be a scientist to do that you can very well be a lawyer and try and do that so that was on question 1 on question 2 um top three things wow okay so let me try uh, the 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 first thing i would suggest is break free from your stereotypes uh, we are brought up uh, in a particular way we are taught things in a particular way you need to move out of your comfort zone you need to try things which uh, you feel should would uh, allow you to explore different horizons of your existence do that that builds confidence and building confidence makes you want to be a better lawyer in fact it makes you want to be a better anybody so uh, the key to building confidence is actually breaking free from stereotypes and trying to understand who you are beyond those stereotypes the second thing that i would suggest uh, uh the second of the top 3 that i would suggest is uh, try and approach uh, try and approach everything that you come across from a curiosity perspective question things don't take them as granted so far whatever has happened to you in terms of stereotypes break them and going forward don't let stereotypes define your way of life uh, try and question any fact that is presented to you from your own lens try having discussions about history uh, world affairs movies games you're playing songs you're listening to people you know or even with yourself uh, continue thinking about things so that you are able to explore different levels of what your mind is capable of uh that comes in very handy for a lawyer because you are often required to think from different dimensions within seconds um and the third thing that i would suggest is don't get disappointed with closed doors uh there will come different points in your life where uh, you are facing disappointing truths don't let that halt you in your journey keep moving uh, keep trying to uh, explore other opportunities which will lead you to your ultimate goal one closed door does not mean should not mean you stop your journey it just means you got to move through different directions so while i may have sounded extremely uh, i don't know not extremely but obnoxiously uh, lecturers over here by talking about these things but yeah i truly feel these are the top 3 things which would help uh, a budding lawyer become a better lawyer thank you so much nandini and uh, the take aways have been huge so stay interested stay curious and keep moving are the three top tips that we are getting from you and uh, it is pretty insightful you know like young lawyers will only understand this after they have reached a level of success like you and have had those ups and downs and tribulations to uh, reach where you are so and of course the law aspirants are gaining a lot from uh what you said today in terms of being true to themselves in terms of their career choices because it is going to be a major part of their lives that they are going to be spending on the work that they really do and both of them are very very uh, authentic advisors and have proven to be uh, something that you only learn with time and i'm so happy that you have laid it down for uh, future law aspirants as well as young lawyers uh, that they will realize sooner or later because everyone does that you have to remain true to yourself in the process of becoming a lawyer and being a lawyer does not only mean that uh, you practice in a law firm or you do uh, go to courts or uh, which are great professions in any case but also to explore what is it truly uh, what is the space in which you can truly contribute um in a way uh, wherein you're true not only to your talents but also to the field that you occupy 
so that's great nandini and with this i would like to thank you for uh, the kind of time that you spent with us in explaining investment funds practice there's a lot more awareness that has to be created about this field not only for uh, law aspirants but also for young law students as well as uh, young lawyers this is a practice as you rightly said is growing in india and uh, you are uh, you are at the top of things you know the latest developments and therefore you are the best person to uh, get to know about investment funds uh, we at opj in the global university are really thankful to you and uh, the journey that you have had from being a student to was such a successful lawyer and as as i said a leader uh, a woman in a leadership role and you cannot discount that in corporate india is something which is infectious which is inspiring and which is amazing and uh, we uh, as your alma mater really really are proud of your achievements and we would want you to keep shining and growing and making your alma mater proud in uh, in the law firm circle uh, with that i would like to thank all the attendees for being ever so patient and for the questions and the engaging discussion and uh, we can call it a session today thank you everyone thank you